My premise in um, this conversation is that the individual cities, the individual case studies have been quite well documented. I think we've seen this in the past several days. Uh, planners, architects, policymakers, both academics, but also historians. Um, that work is ongoing, but I'm heartened to see um, the sense that Luciana gave to me when she visited in 2017, that in fact, each of these individual new town capital cities have been uh, documented in their own cultures, in their own languages, in their own contexts. Um, Luchan also persuaded me that there were emerging conversations, uh, what I might think of as bilateral dialogues from one city to the next in relationship to architectural heritage or preservation or environmental or social issues. Um, but my perception has been that we seem to uh, not have an abundance of scholarship, which is treating these types in a comparative manner or, or in, a, in a kind of synthetic way. Um, there are a couple of exceptions to that, but overwhelmingly, uh, my feeling is that the individual studies of these cities are quite rich and robust on a variety of topics. And this conference gives us a real opportunity to share, compare notes across cultures. Uh, and I really applaud uh, Luciana, you and your colleagues in organizing this set of uh, conversations. On the short list of English language literature that we have on the topic, um, you know, among the authors that have been quite significant in this space has been um, the urban planner, uh, uh, Lawrence Vale, Larry Vale, uh, here at MIT in Cambridge. Uh, his 92 volume, which we, he, he revised in 2008, Architecture, Power, and National Identity has for a couple of decades been the definitive volume on this topic. Um, in revising it in 2008, um, you know, Larry Hale, you know, continued to reinforce the kind of primacy of politics, the role of planning and policy, and even acknowledged the role of architecture, but said astonishingly little about the role of landscape. Uh, you can see here on, on page 43 of that volume, um, he does make one reference to landscape in the context of Sixtus V and um, uh, Counter-Reformation Rome and the planning of the new capital of Rome. So even there, quite a, quite a, let's say, a conservative point of view with respect to the kind of dominant reception. More recently, in 2006, we have the edited volume edited by David Gordon called Planning 20th century capital cities that has quite a lot of interesting and important material. It includes, in fact, a chapter by Larry Vale on the urban design of these capital cities in which landscape is fixed specifically to the case of Canberra, Australia. As we've seen uh, in the conversations here over the past couple of days, there's a very specific relationship there. And in fact, in the volume overall, um, you know, Peter Hall makes a contribution on definition of seven types of capital cities, but also what is their future. And again, landscape is very hard to find in these, in these, in these accounts. Now, I'm in no way being critical of Peter Hall or Larry Vale or David Gordon. Uh, Gordon, in fact, edited and included one chapter on Canberra, Australia with specific reference to landscape. But my point here is simply to suggest that in English, we seem to have a, a paucity of material that looks synthetically across these cases. When they do um, appear, they tend to neglect landscape as a lens or a way of understanding these places. And that's something that I'm hoping that this conversation can address, but also our work going forward together might be able to address, because I think it's quite a, a missed opportunity uh, in that respect to neglect landscape as a particular uh, frame of reference. As we've seen in the past several days, of course, um, this uh, putative uh, history of landscape as a lens for new national capitals. We might begin with the American experiment here. This is L'Enfance uh, 1791 manuscript copied in 1887. Ultimately, of course, um, we see here the example of a national new town as capital on a so-called greenfield site that was perceived to be empty as the resultant of a political compromise. That aspect of this work continues into the 20th century. Uh, you can see it here in Endicott's uh, revised plan, and it persists through this tradition in the 20th century of the new town, new capital, as a venue for political compromise through kind of geograph geographic exoticism. Uh, this is the 1901 uh, Macmillan plan, which embodied that 
and brought it to, to realization. Similarly, as we uh, heard from uh, Robert Freestone, uh, Canberra, Australia is a significant case here. Uh, this is, of course, the Canberra City Plan from 1912 um, with uh, Robert Burley Griffin and Marion Mahoney Griffin. Uh, of course, you know, Robert Freestone referred to Canberra as something as received as a, a garden without a city, something more of a suburb. Um, I'm quite struck by this drawing. This is Ink on Silk by Marion Mahoney Griffin. And of course, there's a deeper story to be told here, both about their partnership and Marion Mahoney Griffin's contributions to this project, but equally to the embeddedness of landscape architecture in these practices. If in Washington, DC, we saw the tradition of a kind of Beaux-Arts design in which um, Macmillan can modify a kind of uh, city beautiful following Burnham uh, and the plan for Chicago, uh, the Griffins embodied that equally in their plans for Canberra. And in that regard, I find both Washington DC and Canberra significant cases. But in fact, we might add to that list Ottawa, Canada or other examples where landscape was integrated, but in a kind of city beautiful modality, emulating the model of, um, of, uh, uh, of Chicago and Burnham's plan of Chicago. And while these are quite a significant case studies, my claim here is that these precedents don't really fully anticipate uh, the canonical examples of 20th century uh, planning that we've come to appreciate in these days. While those projects are notable for incorporating landscape architecture, they do so in a way that's quite distinct from the main body of work in the 20th century. By contrast, we might consider the five cases we've heard about uh, these past few days here in this space uh, all coming from the global south, interestingly. Uh, I'm compelled by the fact that each of these come from parts of the global south, but also many of them represent um, nation state formation, a, an attempt at a kind of po putative post-colonial opening, but also they tend to represent the export of planning and design services from the west, let's say, or from the, from the global north uh, to the global south. Uh, I'll include in that list here uh, this plan by Herman Jensen from the 1930s uh, of Ankara, as we heard from Ali Singhasan. Similarly, uh, the plan for Islamabad by Daxiodas that we heard about from Ahmed Khan earlier. Equally, uh, the understudied and really important work of Abuja and this uh, ongoing project beginning with Makarg, uh, Wallace, Roberts, and Todd and continuing with the work of Kenzo Tange. These are really quite fundamental uh, precedents and I'm glad that this conference has surfaced them for international uh, dialogue and discussion. Of course, more work needs to be done on each one of these. Each one of them, I would argue, represent a form of landscape planning in the context of the 20th century. And yet my claim will be that two um, of the most well-studied examples are exemplary, being Shandigar and Brasilia, uh, in part because they represent a, a more full understanding of the landscape medium. That is the design of these two cities and their reception in the literature have been described in terms of how landscape forms as a medium of design. Um, again, as we've learned today from um, Vikram Aditya Prakash, um, the original master plan for the, for the new capital of Punjab reconciled these two scales. On the one scale, there was a form of ecological urbanism, uh, what uh, Prakash described as prescient hydrological pathways. Um, and then studying that in terms of the geology, the, the fluvial geomorphology and the hydrology of this, of this region. But then reconciling that in relationship to the design of the built environment um, in, in both Chandigarh and Brasilia, you can see here the, the notion of earthwork or the shaping of the land as fundamental to and central to this conception of this new, uh, this, new, this new form of space, this new form of urbanity. Now, of course, these other examples of Ankara and Islamabad and Abuja have their charms as well. I don't mean to neglect them, but I have evidence that in both Chandigarh and Brasilia, that landscape thinking was involved both at the scale of the region, but equally at the scale of the human being. And that combination ends up being quite uh, important, I believe. Now, ultimately, much has been said about the role of architecture here. And of course, you know, we have to describe the role of uh, Le Cabousier among others. But more importantly than that, for my purposes here, what I want to suggest is it's the attention to uh, 
the design of the public realm, the design of the streets and the public spaces, the quality of landscape formation. You can see this here in this working drawing uh, from Corb's set, looking at streets and kind of plazas and the development of a, a more robust uh, landscape language, let's say. Um, in that sense, I think in, in, in both cases, in both um, Chandigarh and Brasilia, I'm interested in a certain quality of life, a certain quality of urbanity in which landscape becomes the medium of the public realm. And I'm interested in that for a number of reasons that I'll try to make clear um, in the coming moments. Um, generally, um, the literature on these projects have tended to express anxiety around these cases, in some cases describing them as pure failures, in other cases, you know, documenting and presenting them uh, sympathetically. Ultimately, most often the dominant, certainly English language uh, literature on these capital new towns um, associates them with, with the failures of modernist uh, spatial planning. Uh, these cities tend to be critiqued uh, as either too utopian or too rational, or paradoxically often both. <laughs> these designs are critiqued as both being somehow utopian, but also too, um, too functionalist. Um, oftentimes these cities are critiqued for their representation of forms of top-down political power. And often I find uh, my colleagues are you know, anxious about the expression of that spatial authority, let's say. Um, equally often the critiques of these cities tend to reinforce critiques of decentralized 20th century urban form associated with automobility. Um, many times these critiques embody the old left's kind of right to the city as being lost or somehow not fully evident in these new spaces. That there's a sense that if we could return to the traditional European city that somehow we might get back something socially or politically. And overwhelmingly the literature on these topics reflect that anxiety about landscape as being capable of being the dominant medium of design. And most often these accounts uh, lament the loss of the uh, putative uh, societal and environmental values associated with the traditional street, the traditional grid, the traditional European city. Um, on the other hand, I would argue, and it's my premise here um, this afternoon, that these new town capitals, the best of them, are evident um, across a range of different political economies and different cultures. Um, by claiming new loci of power, they tend to ameliorate or attenuate historic antagonisms and therefore the position of these capitals become a kind of fundamental aspect of nation state uh, formation. Uh, they tend to emerge as a result of compromise by leveraging geographies. As we've heard, of course, that compromise uh, builds upon a denial, active suppression of existing populations and ecologies. And there's much more to be said about that, of course. Um, and that that willful erasure is most often accomplished by declaring these sites um, empty or somehow void of, of human or non-human actors. And of course, that there's a dark side to that. What, what Dr. Renato Leal Rego referred to as a kind of interior imperialism, I think, which is apt here. Or what uh, David Vanderberg referred to as the appropriation or projection of an emptiness, which is not actually empty. Um, it's my claim here that in contrast to those critiques that while there are challenges associated with these 20th century practices, ultimately the best of these projects lead to novel forms of spatial planning that are shaped by political will and, and cultural desire rather than through commerce. Uh, the economies and cultures of these cities, uh, while initially are kind of alien to urban experience, they tend to gather and reproduce their own unique cultures and economies over time. Um, these cities are therefore characterized by their ambition to a level of spatial planning. And therefore, while we should remain critical and make judgment about them, we also have to understand that there was an aspiration to a, an appropriate form of spatial expression relevant to uh, the desire for nation state formation. Uh, in this regard, I don't wanna suggest that they are uncritical successes. Having said that, the desire to aspire to a new form of urbanity is something that I am sympathetic with as a part of the project of the enlightenment. Um, they represent the best of these cities an implicit resistance to traditional modes of urban planning. Um, and as a result, I think not coincidentally, these projects often represent very good examples of landscape as a medium of urbanism. I think uh, Leonardo Cruz, uh, Leonardo Cruz mentioned this earlier today in re referring to a shift 
away from a concern for delimiting the perimeter of new towns toward an opening onto landscape and territory. Uh, in that regard, you know, my own intellectual project for the past couple of decades has been focused on this notion of landscape and recuperating landscape as a medium of urbanization. And in order to support that, I, I wanted to just say a word about um, this kind of complicated concept of, of landscape. Um, on the one hand, um, what I want to begin by saying is that, you know, landscape brings quite a lot of baggage. On the other hand, I've found it probably the most useful lens through which to think about these uh, cities, but also as a way of thinking about urbanization uh, going forward. Um, most simply, landscape is a medium of exchange between human subjects and their environments. Uh, it's not a passive reception. The landscape is not out there outside of us, but rather an active projection between the building of the built environment and its reception or experience by human subjects. It's important to acknowledge that landscape is not shared across all cultures. Um, in many cultures, landscape is associated with a kind of nature outside, you know, it's somewhere in the Amazon or it's in the Andes or it's in the Himalayas external to the city. Um, but by contrast to that, what I would argue is that landscape is valuable precisely because it reflexively gathers both broader environments and territories with the medium of design at the scale of the human body. That combination, which we see in the design of Chandigarh, which we see in the design of Brasilia, is what I'm getting at there. Um, it's an open question. You know, we know that landscape is a very particular invention of Western European culture. It's clearly been exported in a kind of imperial colonial project around the world. The question is, can we think of landscape in other ways? I think that's an open question for our field today as to whether it's valuable to continue thinking about landscape as a way of understanding these places or whether that's simply a failed colonial imperial project of the West and we have to find new terms. Suffice it to say that the dominant discourses in design and planning have tended to relegate landscape to either the territory or the periphery, something associated with wilderness or nature or to a marginal or decorative role at the scale of the garden. In contrast to that, over the past two decades, of course, landscape has reasserted itself in the context of landscape urbanism, and there's more to be said about that uh, in other contexts. But for our purposes here, what I want to suggest is that, you know, there are challenges associated with the recuperation of Le Corbusier, and of course, uh, critiques available around Le Corbusier's project. For my purposes, maybe more so than Le Corbusier, um, I've been interested in the work of another 20th century urban planner, uh, namely Ludwig Hilbersheimer, uh, the German. Now, Hilbersheimer never designed a new national capital, so far as we know. He designed quite a number of things. Very few got built. But it's um, Hilbersheimer's conception of landscape as the dominant medium of 20th century urbanization that I'm most interested in. You can see that here in his concept of the settlement unit, which he published in 1949 in the new regional pattern, um, both in his work in Berlin uh, before the war and in the Chicago from 1937-38, Hilbersheimer was interested in a form of urbanization in which the traditional city gave way in favor of a form of landscape urbanization. Uh, for Hilbersheimer, it was not political power, it wasn't the new national capital, but rather for Hilbersheimer, it was industrial economy. He was working in the wake of Henry Ford, Ford having argued that in fact, industry would decentralize the city. And in fact, that's what came to pass in many American cities. Um, Hilbersheimer, of course, um, was widely criticized for this work um, and came to be seen as uh, the best evidence of the failures of modernist planning. But what's interesting and less well reported is that he also produced through his theories, the best example of publicly subsidized uh, modernist housing in the history of the United States. Uh, this is Detroit and his project that came to be known as Lafayette Park, in which um, a site that had sat empty for four years was reconceived by uh, Hilbersheimer as planner, Mies van der Rohe as architect. I mention this here in part, again, to re reference the notion of landscape as a medium through which the contemporary city might be rethought. And revisiting this and recuperating this as an alternative strikes me as an important project going forward. It's true that in, in fact, um, uh, in spite of its using landscape as a primary medium of urbanization, primary medium of design, Lafayette Park is to this day, uh, both more diverse uh, racially and ethnically than either the city of Detroit or its suburbs. 
It's also, of course, much more environmentally sustainable, but also has maintained its real estate values. You can see here 1956, 57, and then uh, two decades ago. Uh, it's a medium uh, of design in which landscape is the primary medium of the public realm. Uh, it's a place of gardens and beautiful tree canopy. And I wanna invoke this here to suggest that, you know, Chandigarh, Brasilia sit in a constellation, not just of new town capitals, but also of um, sites that have been reconceived, forms of urbanity in which people are, um, people are living extraordinarily rich and diverse uh, and fulfilling lives in spite of the critiques of this kind of design work that's, that have been leveled. Now, of course, <clears throat> I'm interested in the fact that Hilbersheimer was citing Henry Ford, the, the rabid American proto-fascist who was funding you know, Adolf Hitler and thinking about Brazil and Brasilia and thinking about what we've discussed these days um, about the imperial project of interior colonialism. Um, I, I, of course, have to mention the, the failed project of Fordlandia. This was the 1928 to 1934 uh, colonial plantation that Henry Ford and the Ford Motor Company conceived to develop as a kind of uh, rubber plantation along the Bauhaus River. Um, many, many things to be said about this. Uh, I wanna refer to uh, Renato Leo Rigo's concept of Amazonia as a graveyard of failed modern planning ideas. And I would certainly put this as a kind of poster child. Now, while this was not really a new town per se, but more of a kind of uh, plantation colony, I do have to acknowledge this as really the, the sins of the kind of imperial colonial project associated with advanced capital in the 20th century. And in which, of course, we have to understand this as a purely instrumental projection of power. And I wanna, I wanna you know, indict this uh, and its failings, its cultural failings, its environmental failings, but also its failings in terms of human beings and human subjectivity to kind of the, the idea of importing uncritically a kind of American model of industrial enterprise into the Amazon, of course, uh, is a, a set of sins uh, that are reprehensible uh, by every measure. Um, and of course, we're fortunate that there have been quite a number of scholars looking at this and its failure over the recent past. Uh, but you know, the idea that this was a project of literal colonial pro projection of space and authority onto the Amazon uh, on the backs of you know Brazilian bodies. Um, it's been well described in the um, in the literature, the extraordinary work by Spiglia and and Grandin, among others. I'll, I'll recommend you to that if you're not aware of it. Um, um, Continuing with that line of thought and thinking more precisely about, you know, the pilot plan and, you know, Niemeyer and Costa and Berla Marx at Alia, um, I, I want to return to Dr. Leo Rogo's presentation of the 20th century Brazilian new towns. Um, and I want to make a distinction. I, I think that, in fact, the, the, the capital city projects that we're describing here, they are, they are quite distinct. Um, we tend to view these um, exceptional cases with a kind of suspicion, in part because they don't tend to be or seem to be generalizable. That is, they don't seem to produce knowledge about how to urbanize elsewhere. Uh, we tend to criticize their failure to anticipate emergent, innovative, or novel social and economic conditions. And we tend to be uncomfortable, frankly, with this brutal expression of state power. Um, yet we indict the state for not having done more uh, and often the designers and planners involved are implicated for their own you know, complicity with the state and its authority, but equally for their uh, inability or lack of you know, prescience to anticipate future social and political uh, failures. Uh, most often these critiques of Newtown capitals, they hinge on the perceived environmental or social values of continuity associated with more traditional urban forms of street and square and city grid and the like. And while they may have their charms, it's my contention that in fact, those traditional forms may be more appropriate to the Western European context that they emerge from. They might be less appropriate to post-colonial emergence of a kind of nation state forming its own modernity. Now, of course, that modernity was itself the result in, of an inheritance from Europe. So it's more complicated. But as far as I can tell, the best of these experiments represent forms of urbanity that are, I would argue, just as culturally enriching, just as socially diverse, and I would argue even environmentally more healthful than either the traditional European city they abandoned or the neoliberal financialized urbanization engine that we see in most cities uh, today. Uh, of course, we can indict the planners and architects of these places for their lack of anticipation of the extraordinary population growth and demand for these cities. Uh, yet we can agree that those places were spatially designed with a coherent project 
that they remain as exemplars in contrast to the alternatives that have emerged around them or since. This puts us in a difficult space of interpretation where most often these projects are simultaneously criticized, their planners and designers, for the exercising of spatial authority while also critiquing them for their lack of ability to accommodate growth. And so this is a kind of double bind that strikes me as problematic in this work. And I think ultimately, I'm certainly happy to critique uh, the failures of modernist planning, but ultimately I do think that there are many quite laudable aspects of these projects that we seem to have lost an appetite for. Among those, I would say, the desire to imagine a form of urbanity absent the neoliberal economy, the idea that there was a desire for expressing a new spatial and cultural formation that would be equivalent to a new way of living, but in which both environmental conditions, hydrological conditions, uh, ecological futures might be reconciled with the quality of design uh, in the public realm. And in this regard, I think that the, the, the works um, uh, that have been described earlier and what Luciana Savoya have described in her Earthworks, Beacons and Gardens kind of description of the pilot plan, I think holds up uh, quite well. Um, for me, this image sums up a notion in which it's not simply the question of drainage. It's not a technical or engineering consideration alone. It's not simply a matter of draining the soil. It's in fact, using topography, the shape of the land as a construction in which the shape of the public realm might emerge. Uh, in that regard, of course, we have to acknowledge the, on the one hand, the, the hubris, the, the ambition or the audacity of these designers. And at the same moment, I think we have to acknowledge at least there was an attempt for however uh, long it lasted to try to imagine a new way of living appropriate to, to new forms of modernity. Among the challenges that we face when we encounter these projects, I think, has been their reception in our field has been shaped by the way in which they've been photographed and described. And I'm using these images here rhetorically, and the kind of chimerical, ephemeral quality on the horizon. Um, but I think for, for many audiences, especially those that have been critical of these projects, images like this uh, and a kind of abstraction stand in for what they feel is a kind of human alienation. I think many critics have looked at these images and imagined uh, the, the impossibility of kind of humanity or human scale, so-called. Uh, of course, this is a new set of spaces. It's a set of spaces in which there is abstraction. It's true. But I'm arguing here that rather than alienation, it has produced an extraordinary diversity of forms of urbanity, actually. And I think many of you know this material better than I do, so I'm the last one to to tell you about it. Of course, we do have to describe the limitations of the pilot plan and the fact that it was built at a certain scale at a point in time to accommodate a certain number of residents and the lack of its ability to manage the so-called satellite cities. You know, I view that as a, a, a sociological and policy failure, if not a political failure or failure of political economy, uh, rather than a failure of design. Uh, that is the same level of intentionality, the same level of quality of design could have been applied to those satellite cities. But in fact, as we've learned in these days, that was not the case. Um, I also wanna make an argument for new forms of mobility. Many have critiqued the notion of the automobile-based city. Of course, there are challenges associated with that. Having said that, uh, images like this that we've learned about in these days of the central bus terminal complex and its topographic relationship to the rest of the pilot plan has produced over time what I would argue as a kind of everyday urbanism, a kind of urbanity. And I don't wanna wax poetic about the bus station, but I do think that there's something here that I think we should reflect upon. Uh, likewise, these commercial high streets, which characterize uh, the relationship between the major aspects of the pilot plan and the super quadra, I think have held up quite well. Uh, of course, as the scale of the city grows, uh, there, there are challenges there. Having said that, um, my argument here is that this form of urbanization, this form of new city has not only the abstraction of the capital, not only the sense of alienation from the scale of these things, but has produced spaces of appearance. And these spaces of appearance, they range from on the one hand, images of performance or images of kind of self-recognition or self-representation such as in advertising, but equally they have produces um, you know, spaces of political speech. And there's nothing about the typology of the street or its dimension, nor the relationship between the building block and the traditional street wall of the European city 
that precludes those forms of appearance. So my argument here is that the social and environmental values we associate with the European city are not necessarily inscribed in those formal terms, but in fact, the things that we associate with the traditional city, the street as a space of public protest or the street as a space of public appearance and performance, these persist in spite of the novelty of this form. And I would argue that that novelty is inscribed best through thinking of it as a medium of landscape design. The super quadra plays an important role there. And of course, at the beginning, this was a site of, again, potential alienation and abstraction. But at the same moment, over time, that form of alienation and abstraction gives way into deeper lived and more meaningful cultural experiences. Uh, landscape is a medium that takes time, but I would argue in a place like Brasilia, landscape is the medium of public appearance. It is the medium of the public realm. And it's the quality of design, not simply the presence of hydrology or engineering to drain the site, but it's in fact the presence of design from the scale of the region or the territory through the design of the street to the quality of the plant material, the shaping of the ground material, and to the individual gardens that characterize the kind of proximate lived experience of this place. Now, there's more to be said about differentiating between the quality of these spaces. And of course, many, many people, designers, architects, landscape architects and designers to be credited here. Um, but what I wanna suggest is I believe we have to um, move past the kind of knee jerk uh, rejection of these new experiments in spatial planning and to recognize that they promised or aspired to a form of environmental sustainability, as well as a form of humanity, a form of urbanity that might be associated with this new form of living. Um, in my experience, when I talk to people who have done research in and lived in these cities, to a person, they tell me that they are extraordinary places. And I can say that about Brasilia and Chandigarh and many of the examples that we've studied. At the same moment, somehow collectively, when we reflect about them as a discipline, we seem to review them as failures and therefore tend to critique them and their ambition. Uh, I'll just close with two um, kind of contemporary openings that suggest to me the ways in which the superquadra and this notion of living with landscape as a medium of the city are still with us and quite productive um, today. Uh, the first of those would be um, one of a series of films produced by uh, Brazilian architects, in this case, The Modernist Life, which is available on YouTube. On the one hand, it's a, it's a kind of promotion of a certain way of living. But what I appreciate is that it's a video that moves us from this view, the top down kind of synoptic overall view into the lived experience of what it's like to be in these places. Now, of course, this is a certain kind of bourgeois view and not everyone can afford to live here and there are societal and political and economic critiques to be made there. Having said that, I believe the fact that these places are being reinterpreted right now by contemporary architects gives me quite optimism. Similarly, the Super Quadra continues to be, the pilot plan continues to be quite productive for international architects from the outside, uh, whether it be uh, academics at Harvard like myself, or in this case, the work of Carlo Ratti at MIT and his proposition to extend a portion of the pilot plan into an adapted or new form of biologically productive Super Quadra. In closing, let me just say again, thank you, Luciana. Thank you to all the organizers. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I am humbled to be in the presence of such extraordinary thinkers, scholars, architects, planners, and I'm happy to contribute to this as a project going forward. I will likewise welcome you all to visit us in Cambridge. We are open for business. We're happy to visit you as well, uh, and we'll look forward to the discussion going forward.